this time I'm back shed, the HQ Holden that I call Mucus is back. Last episode, we fitted him with a fresh big block. Well, this time, it's time to drive him. Stick around, take a look. So if you haven't seen the HQ that I call Mucus, I'll give you a quick rundown and bring you up to speed. Firstly, the name. When we bought Mucus way back in episode five, along with another white sedan, in that episode, I gave this car its first wash down. And in the late Arvo Sun, it had a yellowy, greeny type of color to him. It kind of looked like something you'd cough up if you had a chest infection. This HQ is a factory V8 car, but when we found him, he was a roller, no motor, no transmission. And after that first episode, I actually got contacted by the previous owners and said, hey, we've owned those two cars since early 2000, and this one was a roller when we owned it. So this car had been sitting for well over two decades with no motor and no transmission. So in the first full episode on this car, we stripped him out, cleaned him down, fitted a big block Chevy. There's a bit of a walk down memory lane for me because as a kid, I had a 454 and turbo 400 in a H series body, a little bit newer than this one, a 74, Mucus is a 72. So I had this 396 in the back of the shed for a little while. It's high compression, got good oval port heads on it, um, a main stud girdle, some good rods. It's, it's not stock, it, it's gonna go just fine. And so a couple of other things that had to go along with that is a bigger transmission, the turbo 400 I'm using, and in this episode, a bigger diff. We're fitting a nine inch to Mucus. He's got the factory 10 bolt, and that's probably where we're gonna start. We'll get this 10 bolt out, we'll get the nine inch in, let's stop talking and get into it. I've just positioned him on the hoist, but before we put him in the air and start pulling the diff apart on this guy, I'll show you where we got up to, because realistically, I can't really remember myself. And by the looks of that, we didn't finish with window winders or anything. But all the seats went back in, the trims, we got new carpet, which is a long way from where she was at when we found her. Front seats are back in. Um, we got all the switch panel wired up, but I never finished putting the dash back together. I just fired it. And then of course the next job after that was get the diff done. So, and I think, that oh that's an air cleaner oh that's the next bit i'll show you but i did want to keep this under the bonnet it is not going to clear it's definitely coming out through the bonnet on this one so at some stage we'll we'll rectify the fact we have no air cleaner by cutting a hole getting that air cleaner onto the car but that means i've got to do something with this and that was a bugbear of mine right from the start is they're not Monaro stripes, they're just random stripes. Monaro stripes had a thinner stripe on the outside and they're a much wider stripe that came down onto the, the nose cone. So they bugged me, they bugged me a lot. And when we go to cut the bonnet, we're gonna have to get creative on that. I'm not touching the paintwork on this thing until it runs and drives, maybe even until it drives down a drag strip. I'm gonna leave it like that. And I won't even worry about the rust in the doors and there's some in the guards. All that shit can wait, but if I gotta do something with the bonnet as far as cutting a hole, I wanna address that crap. So let's start getting all that under there. First thing we're gonna do is get the, the drum brake backing plates off this guy, because they're gotta be swapped over to the nine inch housing. And we're gonna unbolt the control arms here, and also at, and also at the top up here, take this guy out. And I remember, I broke, I think I borrowed a, a brake line for the white HQ. So that's actually out of the white HQ, but I've screwed it back in there to keep the fitting. Those backing plates there, and we'll probably have to remake these lines to go over the nine inch. So uh, wheels off, 
get into the backing plates, get them off, which axles have to come out. So we'll get into that first. So if you happen to see any rust in mucus, just do what I'm doing. Ignore it. Just look the other way. It'll be fine. A bit of rust is the least of mucus's problems at the minute. And to get these backing plates here off, because I need all these, the backing drums, um, the axle's got to come out. So pulling the axles out, come over here, I'll, I'll show you. So to pull these axles, there's a flange behind the axle and that's what these holes are. A bit hard to see on this side. Maybe I should go the other side. Oh no. You see where that, where my finger is, there's a bolt there and there'll be, there'll be four, like one, two, three, four. And you just rotate your axle around, get that one, rotate it around, get that one, et cetera, et cetera. And then the axle slides out towards you. Well, that's in theory. We're yet to see how tight this guy is, but I'll knock those four bolts off pull the axle and then we can take this backing plate along with that line off. One thing I think will be in my favour is if that nut comes out of there it would be really in my favour. One thing I think will be in my favour is this guy being parked for so long it hasn't been tortured, the diff hasn't been flogged with a, a bigger engine or anything like that because generally if you do and the twist the splines a little bit they stick in the hemisphere and they're very hard to get out so that could be famous last words I know and I still can't get this nut out got him yeah that could be famous last words I know going oh shouldn't be too hard but Parked for 20 years probably didn't put a lot of stress on the diff. The diff's probably fine. So why are you changing it then, Michael? And they're sticking in that socket because of all the built up rust and brake dust. So why am I changing it? Well, that's an easy question to answer. Is when I found him, he didn't have a, a tail shaft, had no drive shaft. And with the Turbo 400 in this guy, they did make a factory 10 bolt the Turbo 400 tail shaft, but they're really collectible cars like Monaro, Statesman, stuff like that. So to find a factory one, it was just gonna be astronomical price wise. And also the big block can sit slightly further back because of the length from the mount to the back. So the Turbo 400 could be a little bit further back, which I did have to modify that cross member. So it's probably the case. And yeah, I just turned a 253 Trimatic cross member around. I'm just tapping it on the drum. To get that nut to fall out. I reckon seven or eight thousand more taps and it'll come out. There it goes. Yeah, so rather than chasing up factory turbo 400 cross member tail shaft, I was gonna have to have one made, I guess. It was the cheapest way. But I didn't see the point in making or having a 10 volt to turbo 400 cross member made for this car when this is going to be a fairly healthy little big block contradiction term to little big block but it is it's the smaller brother to the 454 and so i thought if i'm getting a tail shaft made the washers are stuck on there fumbling around with that so if i'm getting a tail shaft made i figured i'd just wait slow down and put a nine inch in it you don't need a nine inch if you were doing this conversion you had a running car right um you don't need a nine inch behind a mild big block you don't you could street drive it they're pretty pretty tough but that's a 275 open ratio so it's a highway ratio so it was never going to be any good so it was starting to add up you know do i get a tail shaft then i'm going to change ratio then i'm going to do limited slip or something so it just made sense the nine inch you can change the center quicker whereas these guys you've got to have them set up professionally if if you want to change ratio because the pinion comes in first then the hemisphere and it's all bolted into the housing itself whereas the nine inch is different oh, i'll show you see with this guy's a back loader so the pinion comes in from that way then the hemisphere comes in and I, I will unbolt that later and show you whereas the 9 inch 
the whole center is independent of the actual housing so if you want to change just the center you can do it yourself pretty quickly it's just axles out unbolt the center change the ratio that guy is a 3.7 with a mini spool i hate mini spools but i'll get to that later so like i say it was just adding up it didn't make sense trying to stick with the 10 bolt when i knew the ratio wasn't going to work it was an open center so it's just going to be a one legger spinning one leg or spinning one wheel and that wasn't going to work so i just slowed down for once my brain said hey why don't you slow down and uh maybe get the money to get the nine inch and do it all in one go get the tail shaft and nine inch all in that way you can run a different hemisphere and i had that center here already I, I didn't have to buy that so it sort of made it made sense to get the nine inch use a different center so that brings us to today here we go we'll see if we can't get that out just prise the backing plate forward just so you know you're not pulling against the backing plate i'll show you what i mean so if you can see in there that's the backing plate there and I've just prized it forward off that thread because if you're pulling on this axle, could be that backing plate binding up against that little thread. But if you pull it forward, then you know you're only pulling on the bearing and you're pulling the axle out of the center. So I've now got that backing plate. If you see through the hole, I can actually wriggle that backing plate now. There, you can't really see that because the sun's in your eyes. Oh, see that. I guess that axle is not going to be that hard to pull out, huh? No, it's actually not going to be hard at all. But I'll give you one thing. I used to break a lot of holding banjos back with the, when I was a kid in the H, and so I changed a lot of axles. One thing, if they are a bit tight to come out, or you're finding you can't get at them, you don't have a slide hammer, grab your drum, put it back on the wrong way around, and put your wheel nuts on, snug them down and then pull the drum and that'll, that'll pull the axle out you can get a slam at it if you if you create a little gap between where the wheel nut is um, and the drum you can more or less create your, your own slide hammer the one pitfall is and i know this because i did it don't just put two on put all five on and try and keep them the same distance otherwise if you just got two on and you're slamming at it take your drum off and you've got two lumps here these are pretty heavy and robust but the old the old banjo that was in the eh i did actually dent it and then had to bash it back they were never the same anyway oh and one thing if you're wondering why I just took the wheels off you've already been in here the drum's gone yeah because i had the drums re-drilled the new axles i'm using a ford pattern and the reason i'm using a ford pattern is for the bigger ford wheel studs it was just simpler ford nine inch didn't have to re-drill the axles so i'm using the ford pattern and then the ford studs are actually a larger diameter so they're a little bit tougher too so yeah hence why the drums already off i, I pulled the drums had them sent away when the diff was made so it's now got holden pattern there and then your ford pattern there that's why so kind of just like the wheels that drums now got both patterns the same as the wheel we just go from these little studs you can see they hang on i'll get a i'll get a vernier rather than guess at it i'll tell you exactly what the difference is i don't know is that 11 mils maybe 11 mil well they're half inch that's oh i'd, I'd almost say that's 13 mil but we all know they're half inch they're 12 and a half mil and again that that probably doesn't sound like a big deal and it's probably not but i do want to throw a little bit of power at this thing and i'd hate to find out at about 100 mile an hour that these studs weren't up to the job so another reason to go 90. and that axle's popped out as well so that's great if you're just doing a nice street driver with some you know a bit of with a few cubes you really wouldn't need to do it but i've already explained that i think so that's got your backing plate free but the next thing is this handbrake cable in here 
runs along there to there now you can decide whether it's easy to take it off from here which in this one it's not or whether it come up front and there's a little circlip there so that circlip goes around that has to come out this way like that one that I've already done on the other side that just pops off and then this releases your handbrake cable here so if you follow your cable along and how they come apart is you just get some slack in the line and just pop that little ball out through that groove so follow your line up to the front there there'll be a nut there a nut there and a flat section generally back there is square or flat and you can just get a shifter on it and then you just hold the shifter and ratchet the bolt out you're going to see i've adjusted that and up here now that'll give me enough slack that i can pull down on that and i'll need two hands so that'll pull out now and so this whole backing plate can now come off because that's the one with the broken brake line and no i'm not replacing these brake shoes or anything just yet it's got bigger issues than whether or not its back brakes are perfect and let's face it when i get this thing going they're the first thing that are going to feel the pain i'm actually going to replace that hose with a new one so i think i'll try and disconnect him from there and take that circlip off and take the hose and everything with me and then do all that on the ground so we'll knock that try and knock that fitting out or un undo that fitting knock that circlip out and that should allow us to start unbolting here and up there and you won't believe it i got that i was sure that was going to snap off i was already planning how i was going to remake that brake line snap it off there and have to redo it but that crack i just got that half inch on the back there and that's a three eighth on the front and then i heated it of course we all love the heat just to expand it and she's come undone that doesn't look real great whatever and it's a good sign that there's fluid coming out of it means it's not rusted solid Imagine the stories that brake fluid could tell. Hey, remember that time we sat and did nothing for like 20 years? And with that circlip off, that'll allow you to take that hose back through there. All right, let's start getting these arms off. And we'll just cut this wire. And before you spin out about cutting it, is it gonna drop? The shock will bring it down slow. So I leave the shock connected. And she'll just come down barely move actually barely move maybe it won't come down maybe it was already down and we'll just see if the shock yeah this sh i might have to take the shock to get that spring line yeah po probably oh no that one's, that one's pretty much pretty much out so if I lift that back up over, yeah, that one's out. So if the other one come out, I should be able to wriggle that one back up there on that. He's, he's coming out too. So I just got that to a comfortable height on the locks. And I'll just take the jack. To the diff, I'll just stop anything crazy happening. So that's got the weight there now, so I'll knock these bolts off. The other thing is when I'm taking the diff out, I can chuck the chains across it and hopefully wheel it out on this guy. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll just manhandle it. Actually, if I am going to do that, I might reposition that. I might twist that around. That way that yoke will sit right on that. Oh, this isn't a transmission jack, that's a differential jack. 
All right, I'll get these on then. I like these guys because they don't damage anything. There he goes. Look at that. Plain as. 20 year old bolt. Well, 50 year old bolt. Hasn't been on the road for 20 years. I thought that'd just be surface rusted to hell. But anyway, that's going back in. So that one. Right. Have a diff oil running everywhere. Raise your hand if you can smell it through the camera. You ever smelt old diff oil? Mate, it's the worst. It looks pretty clean, but it's still old as old as Mother Nature. Alright, that one's out. I can do this with one hand. Sure. Sure I can do it with one hand. As if you couldn't. Do it with two hands if I just let that come down. Well, at this point, that was a moderate success. Until it falls off the bars, the back of the bars, it is coming too. It's trying its best. I think that lift it from here anyway, really. So that's the dip on the ground and all I really need to do now is unbend that tab, take that guy out, undo that guy there, take that block out, clean that out. I've got a new hose for it and then we're going to remake the line on that side. Then we'll get the 9 inch out here and start putting him together. I can't get over those bolts. 50 year old bolts. I'm not replacing them and they're probably a better quality bolt than if I went and replaced them to be honest I painted the center the drum backing plates and the actual drums itself so I think what I'll do is just lift the empty housing on top because once I fill with a, a center and some axles and brakes sure it'd be easy to do the brake line on the ground then put it in it's gonna be awful heavy so I'm just going to lift the empty housing onto roll fencing wire because this has got a big drain plug. It's got a big drain plug there so if I just use the fencing wire it'll sit around here and just so it'll sit square on that um on that jack. I'll chuck a bolt in him. It's a remarkably good fit. You would think so was remarkably expensive. Don't scratch me paint. I had many shiny new things. But lots of rusty old things. Not many shiny new ones though. Alright, oh, no. so in with the center from the front. I wonder how far that'll come down if I drop it. I'd say. So I might just support him. I just put a little support under him for stability and I'll pop that center in. And I'll just wipe down. This is a brand new center. And by center I don't mean this center. I mean this section. This is not recycled from another vehicle. This is a brand spanking new center. It was built and just had tubes welded on it and brackets and shit welded on it. But I'm going to clean the face just so it seals. Just with a solvent, thinners, carby cleaner, brake cleaner, anything that's going to get rid of oil, residue, all that sort of crap. And I don't have a gasket. I'm just going to run a bead of silicon because I have a tendency to change ratios in anything else we've had. So why would this one be any different? So. I'll just wipe around the diff centre and grab some silicon. And by silicon, I don't mean the stuff that you seal up the tiles in your bathroom with. I mean a decent Loctite Ultra Blue or something like that. 
It's actually the shittiest one I've ever done because you're watching. But let's chuck this center in and try to ignore what you just saw. these bolts that took me nearly two hours to go and get and we'll nip them in I'll just bring them down so they're snug on the face probably doing like that really and I only go from side to side top to bottom same way you if you just start there and start nipping it in and there's a gap over this side by the time you get to about there and here it's bound up on the threads because it's it's tilted that way so it's bound up on these threads so it doesn't go in you think you got it tight and you look over there or you don't look over there even worse and you've got a gap so it's never going to see if there's a gap so we're just going to stick our studs in like yay Then our backing plate, and I'm going to start with the, the good brake line side. Then our axle. Now, nine inch axles, one's longer than the other. Don't mess it up. Oh, well, you can't really mess it up because it's going to hang out to here if you got the long one in the short side. If you put the short one in the long side, you'd find out when you put the other one in. Just saying, I don't make the rules. Some useless information on nine inches. You hear of big bearing and small bearing, like on a, say like the XY's diff, it's actually got an XB disc brake nine inch that got a bigger bearing. It's a lot wider, that surface there is a lot deeper. This guy's not, it's the thinner bearing with the oil seal. But, you know, chuck him in. So I'm having a bit of trouble getting this axle in. I'm getting it about 10 mil from where it needs to be and it's just, I don't want to go bashing on it. I think we're going to have a change of plan. I've taken the race off the bearing and the race is the, the press in piece that the, surf, the bearing runs around the surface of and the reason I want to try that is to make sure that's pulling in square. Something's not feeling right. But I'm not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it. Put the axle in. And it's it's still not all the way in, if you see. It's still not all the way in. But that's now where I can start pulling that seal there down with the bolt. I'll put the backing plate back on and just start pulling it in. So back to where it was. About an hour ago. Stop whinging. Studs in. It's still going to pull in the last maybe seven or eight millimeters, but that's better than what it was. I've almost got those bottomed out, but but when I try to turn that axle now, I can't turn it. This is a shortened axle. And I actually don't think it's been shortened enough, but I think this axle is now going in and it's touching pin in the spool. I'll show you what I mean. So this is just your normal nine inch center. And if you look down in there, see that pin? Well, this is an open center, but when you change to a spool, it still has that pin in there. And so I'd say that axle is now pushed so far in that it's actually touching the pin because don't get me wrong with a rebuilt center and brand new bearings there's going to be resistance it's not you're not going to spin it over like there's no resistance at all and I checked that when I put that one in it's still spun over this one was spinning okay until my last two turns of these bolts and now it, without really trying to force it it's way too tight so there's something going on 
So I'm going to knock them out, pull this axle back out, and hopefully on the ends of the splines, and, and I'll, I'll just show you on this one, is on the end of that, you'll see a scratch or something where it's been rubbing up against the pin. So let's pull that axle back out and see what's going on. And there's no scratch. There's no scratch. Oh, no, there's no scratch, but look here. Have a look at this. See the pin way down in there? The telltale giveaway, you see there? And there, there's two little indents. Just there. That one's a bit more obvious. So I didn't scratch it because it wasn't spinning around it, but it's pushed into it pretty hard. I guess that makes sense because this axle's not going to turn without the pin. It's just pushing into it. I guess I was expecting something a little bit more obvious, but that's definitely two little marks straight through there where it's pushed into that pin. So with the back end plate back off, and I've just fitted him back up to try and figure out exactly how much too long it is and that gap there is eight mils minus whatever that backing plate is so if that's three then five more mils have to come off the end of that axle so that that can pull right in so there's a fair bit going on there that's the short side axle and it's not short enough so it's not like i've got the long one in the short side and vice versa so yeah so the short side axle from what I can measure, it's about eight mils too long, um, minus the width of that backing plate. So about five mils. But the problem being, it's Friday afternoon. So the machine shop that's two hours away would be pulling down its roller doors right now. So I'll stew on that tonight, I guess, and maybe decide if I'm brave enough to take it off myself and then run a file down the splines and just file those heads back up. If I'm not brave enough to do that, there's still heaps of other stuff I can do. I still got the whole front end to rebuild. I am waiting on a couple little bits and pieces, but I've already got those control arms. But I've already got these control arms ready to go. Um, could measure the tail shaft, get that ready to send first thing on Monday to the drive shaft shop, set the shifter up. There's a million things I can do, so I'm not, I'm not distraught over that. I am because I paid decent money for that short nine inch, and it's got issues. But I mean, that's modified cars. It wouldn't be cars if something didn't go wrong. Anyway, I'm shallow. I'll get up and I'll have decided what I'm going to do that, if I'm doing that tomorrow or whether I'm doing everything else I can until Monday and then run that down the shop. That's two hours away. Alright, see you in the morning. You know what? Screw that, I'll see you in the morning. I'm cutting this son of a bitch right now. Let me show you why I decided that. I was about two mouthfuls in and just went, nah, there's got to be a better way. So I'm looking at that going, geez, if I take eight mil off that, that doesn't leave a lot there. There's, but then take a look at this. If you see that spline, see where the pin is there that I showed you earlier, but then see where the spline is. It doesn't come right out to the edge of the, the diff. And the only way I can really show you any better is if I, I take that light away. And if I put my finger to the end of the spline, and roll my finger down so I can indent it into my finger, it comes to there. So let's go back to the vernier. And if I measure that spline on my finger from there, I oh know, sophisticated way of measuring it, I know, but I can't get anything else down in there. It's only 30 mils from the tip of my finger to the end. You can see the ribs, that's where the spline ended. And if I go to the end here at 30 mils, Have a look. Because I was thinking, that doesn't leave a lot of spline. There's 30 mils there. So 
So I've only got to take 8 mils off. So that's 30 millimeters. Let's widen it out. Oh, geez, that's almost spot on. That's almost 38. So if I take, if I take eight mils minus the back plate of, of three, so I'm only taking five mils off, that'll leave me 33 millimeters of spline. So that means that'll literally be engaged one end to the other. I don't think I'm that concerned anymore. So I just set it up in the vise. So I got my bearing covered so I don't get metal in that. And I've trued him up so he's sitting flat. So, you know, it's not going to be perfect. but So I'm going to measure in 5 mils and I'm going to put a tape mark on that 5 mils like that. So now if you wrap the tape and it perfectly butts up to itself, it should be in a perfect straight, straight line. And then if I just get the, the 1 mil cutoff wheel and run down the edge of that tape, It'll be perfect, ish. All right, I'll clean that off and we'll get into it. Just gonna clean it off with some thinners because you want something flammable if you're gonna grind. No, because I want the tape to stick. And by wrapping the tape around it, you'll know if you've gone square because if you haven't, it just won't line up with the other side. Sure, you can bend the tape a little. And so like I say, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be good enough for me, but... done as I said put the tape leveled it up to make sure I'm square and then just run down the edge of the tape and then just pretty up the end of him is get a file and just run the file down the front of those I did try and bevel the edge off a bit with the with a flapper disc just to smooth this edge back but I'll just run the file that way along the um along the splines Anyway, it's done now. So now we're a machine shop as well. Nope. It's done. So that escalated quickly from I'll see you in the morning to hell no I won't, let's cut this son of a bitch now, but in your face machine shop, don't get me wrong, I'm still disappointed, that wasn't cheap, That that's, that's not a cheap thing to buy, and so you expect it to be right, but I'm shallow and I'm kind of over it because it's in now, and I'll get on to other shit in the morning, I'll get that tail shaft measured, um, and start up the front. So, now, I guess I'll see you in the morning. Last thing last night, I'm pulling the shed door down, just about to pull, turn the lights off, and thought, I'll just put oil in that diff. I'll just put oil in it, plan tomorrow. Uh, so I'm chucking oil in it, and... So I don't know where you can see that, but that's oil.
That's leaking all the way around there. Yep, it leaked. And not around the drain plug. It's actually the weld that's around the drain plug, which a drain plug in a you know a performance type of diff, it is a good idea, but right now we're not we're not friends. I don't know how well you can see it, but it's not the drain plug itself. Now I've loosened that, to, I've now re-drained the oil out. It's actually right there. That weld there, if you can see that's got oil on it now. It's leaking there. So I'm just going to grind all around the face of that and just run a weld around it. So I've ground all that up, but if you can see there's still just an edge of oil there. So I'll just have to wait. I can't get it clean enough to weld. If I try and weld that now with that oil residue there, it's not going to weld properly. I'm going to be fighting with it. So we might get onto everything else first and come back to that. If you remember the other thing we had to do was make this brake line. So while the diff is still quite low, I still haven't got the shocks connected and the springs in, we might make this line. And it's gonna be fairly intense up in here. It's gonna come out, turn 90 degrees, turn 90 degrees again. But I'll show you a tip a mate of mine showed me a few years back. So I can copy that end easy enough but it's that end that gets intricate and now I don't have the length. So I've never really made that many brake lines, but a number of years ago, a mate did the brake lines in the EH and made them all. And one tip he did show me was use stainless steel wire. Now I don't have stainless, it's nice and soft and easy to straighten. This is just plain old fencing wire and bend the line up using the fencing wire because it's easy to bend, you can get all your your right angles in and that way you also get your length so you go along you can cut your brake line straighten the length so you've already got the length unfolded and then you just mimic this use this as a template and if you see on in the EH the brake lines that he made up around the master cylinder and the proportioning valves they're actually kind of intricate there's a few turns and that sort of thing right across the firewall so made all them and down here, made all them from scratch, just using that technique. Use your wire as a template and then go from there. And thanks, Egg. So I'm just gonna start at that end. And if I come out about 10 mil, put a 90 degree bend there, put another bend there. And we're gonna come down, aren't we? What if I bend that one down a little so it comes down at the same time? Like that, to about there. That's gonna go. I'll have a third go at that. And that's why you don't try it on your brake lines. You can't really have three goes at brake lines. Because they're harder to straighten than they are to bend. So I'll just cut that off. So we've got a fairly sharp bend coming out of that block there, like a 75 degree bend. Same again here. And I'm trying to stay away from 90s just to make it easy for myself. And I'll sharpen that one up a little. Through the little keeper there. And then say a 45 and a 45 and into the wheel cylinder there. So we'll take that out. And now we're just gonna go along with a vernier and measure there, there, the length of that guy. And that'll give you the overall length. Just add those measurements together, write them down. So that's your overall length, we've got 798. So that's the minimum you gotta cut it. Your brake line comes in a roll like that. And you never thought you'd use mass as a kid, huh? I'll never use that in real life. What do you need mass for? And that's come with two lots of fittings. And you get a tool like this fella. And that just straightens your line out. So 
So we want 798, so say 800 plus a little bit. Your little pipe cutter. It's got two little blades in it, so you just tighten him down, spin him round once or twice. Tighten him down again, spin him round again. There we are. That's our starting point for our brake line. So first thing we're doing with our brake line, and I've seen people not do this step, or do it with a file, and that is just chamfer the, the edge, just, just to clean that edge up there. And I don't mean grind it, but you can do it with a flapper disc or a, a fine uh, bench grinder. Wait for it to slow down, and then just twist around. And make sure you're not going into, if the wheel's spinning that way, make sure you're not going in this way. Get on the back side so it's spinning away from you. Otherwise you could get, you know, harpooned. So a little bit more. So if I show you that now, just got a little chamfer on the end of him. So we'll get rid of that. So just turn the vise so I can actually come up from underneath. Start doing up your clamp, maybe do that in first. So decent kits to get that height right. I've actually got a ridge around that little, what do you call that? An anvil thingy. And that'll give you a correct height there. This one doesn't. It's just a cheap one. So I'll come up just below the height of the anvil there and clamp him in. So that's your pipe clamped. And see, that's got a little top on it. That goes in the end of your pipe. And you get this little fella. And this is double flaring. So this is flaring that edge in first. Double flaring for high pressure, like brake line. Single flaring's okay for, I don't know, low pressure stuff, whatever low pressure stuff might be. Low pressure fuel, maybe. That gives you your first flare. First flare goes like that, curls them in. Second flare, cups them up like that, and that's the surface that'll seal. So that's one. Now, if I mess this up, it's because I haven't done many of them, like I said. So that's the first one. And then you just put the tip of your anvil in there. No, clamp the tip of your clamp into the brake line again. And there you go. Double flared brake line. Now this is where you don't forget to put your ends on because obviously you can't put it on. So you go one on that way, one on that way. That one stays there, that one's for the other end. And then start your bending there. And I'm not gonna flare that end yet because like I said, I might have, I've cut this 20 mil too long. Just in case one of my bends is not tight enough or too tight, I've got a little bit of wiggle room. So I'll get my template wire and we're gonna need that one right up as close to that head as we can. So I'm just gonna sit that right on there. For our first. So our second. Going to go right about there. Just hold that guy. See if I'm following my design.
So far, so good. So we'll check how that's going in the car. And so when you're going back into your splitter block, whatever you want to call it, make sure you can go in just with your fingers. Leave everything loose and just go in with your fingers. Because there's going to be tension on the line and here, make sure you can just wriggle everything. If you don't, the line will actually hold the threaded section on a certain angle and the chances of cross threading with brake lines and things like that is pretty high. You cross thread a brake line into the back of that cylinder or into that metering block, you're going to invent words to describe how you feel. Get them in, then spanner them up. That's not too bad, that's gonna go in me little clip there. I'll just get that one and that one nipped up and then just push him up into the clip, but that's pretty good. Clears there, comes down, it'll sit flush against there. That'll do. It's actually a damn sight neater than that factory line. But before you start jumping on me going, oh, why don't you do that one? Because I'm not, that's why. That brake line is not this car's biggest issue. Just get it on the road. So now, with the brake line done, I've got done that one up. I can now put shocks, springs, wheels, drop him down and tighten up all these upper and lower control arms with the weight on it. Oh, and I won't weld that just yet. Um, there's still ever so slightly oil residue and I mean no good can come of that if it's even remotely got oil on it it's going to pop and spit and carry on because it's not perfectly clean and that's just going to make pinholes so I'll leave that we'll get all this done we'll move on and I'll come back to that last thing the Savo or something like that right up. stop talking <laughs> So wheels going back on and we've run into a little drama. These weld wheels have specific nuts and washers and the drama being whoever's owned them previously on the Holden pattern used a big wide weld style washer but when they were used in the Ford pattern which this is now Ford stud pattern and Ford studs for the bigger stud this guy here they've been too smaller too smaller washer and too smaller nut and so that's actually crushed that edge in. If you see, it's a very small washer, whereas these guys specifically for these weld wheels. So when that's crushed in, it won't fit. So now I've got to just chamfer that edge out and bring it back out to that width. So they fit like that. The other side's done. One's done there. I'll go around and do the rest. Not a big issue. So wheels are on, back on the ground. I haven't done up those control arms yet. I'm just going to leave them for the minute. We're actually going to flip him around on the hoist. I want to start on the front end and I want more space to work. So I'm going to flip him around so that all the room is at this end and the tail hangs out this end. Now we've got a complete front end for this thing, which I don't normally do, which is different to the way I did the wagon. The wagon, I just did what was absolutely necessary and got it registered because you're only cruising along in that thing. It's not exactly going to be doing high speed. And then it'll tell you what needs doing after that if a ball joint's a bit sus or whichever. I think we really only did a few bushes on, on the top control arms and then greased that one and he, he passed Rego. This one, however, hopefully he's going to run about 120 mile an hour and a quarter before he gets certified, before it gets Rego. So I'm going to approach this one a little bit different. And we have a table full of parts. We've got inner and outer tie rod ends. Uh, for the steering both left and right we've got lower control arm inner bushes and outer ball joints a drag link an idler arm and ball joints and upper control arm bushes but we're ahead of the game with that one that one and that one 
because we already did them. I had a spare set of these and I can't remember why, but I rebuilt the spare set and swapped them straight over with the wagon. Um, so we're ahead of the game on the top, but anyway, we'll get underneath him. And so under here, we're probably going to start simply by removing a few things. We'll get the sway bar out of the way, we'll get the shockers out. They obviously need to come out. And of course, we've got new springs to replace them. But for now, let's get the sway bar out, shocks out. And then we'll probably start by undoing a little bit of the steering, knocking off this steering joint and this idler arm here. We'll go from there. So I know I've said this a few times, but if you're undoing rusty shit like this and you're undoing it and it starts to tighten up, don't keep going. WD it and go back in. All it is is the rust starting to bind up around that thread. But if you WD it and then go back in, it just allows the rust to drop away. See, that's got real easy now. And then come back out and you'll come back out further the next time. Don't keep forcing it because you're only going to snap it. And honestly, the bolt doesn't care. The only person you're going to hurt there is yourself. You may as well have just got the ratchet and smacked yourself in the head with it. Because that's, you know, that's the only person you're teaching the lesson there is that you're an idiot and you snapped it. So take him back in, allow all the rust to drop away, and then come back out. You'll get out that little bit further. So it binds up again. Rinse and repeat. So that's what I mean. Check out all the rust on the end of that. It binds up and it clogs the thread. And that's why it tightens up. It's basically taking all the rust from from that section and compressing it into this thread in here and locks it up. So go back in, let it all drop away. I must work on too much rusty junk. Not too much. Maybe the perfect amount. Yeah, nearly got this one, but this one has dead set taken 15 minutes or so. Just in out, in out. But I'm telling you, you're better off fighting with this for 15 minutes just in out in out and snapping it off snap bolts is where hot rodders dreams go to die you snap that off that's a half a day drill it easy out it re-thread it tap it find out you've tapped the wrong thread for the bolt you've got again i'm going in again that's another one i thought i had it that time so here we go again because inside this chassis let's see if i can show you inside this chassis wet my finger if i wet my finger there's a bit of diff oil that's the shit that's inside this chassis but that head of that bolt will just be covered in that sort of stuff and it can't get away so just in out in out broken record shit i know but at least this way the afternoon's beer is going to be nice and cold and enjoyable not one of those ones where you set yourself on a mission of self-destruction. Oh, nothing. We're going to go again. More WD. I thought the front one would be worse because it's lower in the chassis. So I thought that's where there'd be more moisture sitting. Therefore, more surface rust. But that's right. This whole video is going to be getting a sway bar out. Success. Happy beers this afternoon. So this is the, there's your steering box, that's your steering arm, uh, steering arm or pitman arm or whichever you want to call it, and I want to get this guy undone here, but I've already heated that guy there, and while I've lowered it down, I'm going to get the trolley jack and just put some upward pressure here, or just, just hold here, because if I'm hitting down on that guy the same as I did on the tie rod arm, that's all going to want to flex that way and I don't want to put too much, I don't want to put any force actually sideways on that steering box. That's one thing I'm not replacing right now. Um, I'm going to let it tell me if it does need to be replaced because they're very expensive. But this guy, just support that arm there so there's no downward flex and they get, give him a tap from the top on that nut. Right, uh, so I'm just going to hold the bottom of that. I'm going to put pressure on it. I'm just going to hold it like that. I'm just going to get an old um, socket extension put on top of there and give that a bang. 
That's just an old sacrificial extension. I'll just pop him on the top there and miss it. I think that went then. Yep. Yeah, with that support there, there was no flex. Give it three good solid hits and she's done. She's off. I'm going to do the same thing as I did with the steering arm on that one. Just support it with a block of wood and just come down from the from the top down, just tap that one and that guy will come off separately. And that guy screws off. So we'll get that, that guy and that's the whole steering arms, tie rods, drag link out. So with all the steering removed, we're on the ball joints and removing the top bottom control arm and also the caliper and disc, everything's going to come off. But when you get to these guys, I've pulled the pin out. I've loosened the nut, but don't take the nut off because there's a spring and that my friends is stored energy. So if you take that off and that happens to come undone or you start pounding on that to get that undone, that whole assembly there is going that way really fast, finger removing type of quick. So leave the nut on and in episode 11, I did it in a bit of depth. But I'm just going to bash a ball joint compressor underneath there. And that just pushes down on the top there. Heat that arm. Give it a bit of a tap. Push that guy in. With a hammer, I mean. Just tap him in underneath that ball joint. So, we'll get that in there. Get that guy undone. This one I've already undone. And just remember, as I said, don't take that nut off. You can see the gap there where it's loosened, ready to go. But you want to go back down to the ground. Get a jack. Get a jack and compress that, then take that nut off and slowly let that arm down so that spring pops out. So just with the jack under there, take the nut off. Got it, get out of the way. So that's the lower control arms out and so we're now going to get up top here and undo this fella here this fella here and pull that bar that way that'll take this whole control arm and you've seen me do that one before in previous episodes and then knock that circlip off the brake line and undo that brake line and that way that whole control arm the caliper, the disc, stub axle will all come out in one piece. So we'll get that guy out. We're nearly there. So, all disassembled. All pulled apart. And we've got a floor full of parts. I did buy some new discs, but I'll explain them in a minute. So that's it. It's beer time. So that was a full day stripping the front down. And sometimes it is a slow process. Like I say, you're not, you don't want to break those bolts off. I got them all out without busting any, and they're pretty good. But tomorrow is going to be a lot of wire wheeling, front end components, um, painting black, and just generally cleaning, starting to reassemble. I did buy new discs. However, if you're going to do this yourself on a budget, you don't need them. You do not need them as part of certification. What certification is if you're watching from anywhere else other than here in Australia is we have ridiculously stringent modification laws. Everything you change, you have to get certified. If you fart in a new car, you have to get the smell certified. That's how crazy it is over here. So you don't need bigger discs or new discs or anything like that. I'm changing discs because I had the new ones drilled for the half inch studs in the forward pattern to match the rear i just want same lug nuts and same studs rear and front because i'm an idiot and i'd try and put the wrong lug nut on at some point no doubt but 
you could have those discs cleaned up and they'll be fine. I didn't change them on my old car. If you remember, this car is a walk down memory lane for me. I had a big block in a, a 74 um, when I was 19 and that's what we're doing again. I didn't change those brakes and it was certified. I'm going to do the same with this. However, there is one thing we're going to do in the morning that is part of certification and we'll get to that then. Anyhow, that's it for now. I'll see you in the morning for some slight modifications, um, some cleaning, painting, and refitting some new bits and pieces. So, I'll see you in the morning. So you've heard me say that these H-Series Holdens, the big block Chevy, is a bolt-in fit. You're not cutting anything, you're not fabricating anything. A set of aftermarket headers and you're pretty much done, factory mounts. It's because these guys are so closely related to some of the cars in the States that came out with big blocks that a lot of the dimensions and framework is the same. The front ends are similar, the brakes are similar, the frame's similar, that sort of thing. So it works well in this conversion. You're not cutting anything out of the way. However, this is a 72. And I can't remember what year it changed, but a model came out and I think it was about 76 or 77, a model came out with radial tuned suspension, or RTS for short. Now, I don't know the difference. I don't know what they did different, but I do know this. I know that the radial tuned suspension cars had a bar that ran from here to here. That's where the lower control arm bolts on, and that's obviously the front cross member. And the reason was with these HQs in the earlier ones, if you had one that you were pretty hard on, they would crack. And I can't remember if it was behind this bracket here or behind the top control arm bracket. You HQ guys will be able to tell me was if it was there. My brain's trying to tell me that it was actually on the inside behind this. This guy's pretty good. I guess not being on the road for 20 years helps that. But if it was your old one tonner or something or ute that you bashed around, Somewhere there they had a stress crack and a bar from here to here spreads the load and takes that upward flex when you're treating this like crap on a rough road or loaded heavy. So we're going to put these bars back in from that point there across to the cross member. This one I can't find any cracks but we're going to put the bars in anyway just for that little bit extra weight out front I thought it'd be a good idea the certifier or the engineer might actually like the fact that they're in there but rather than chasing all over the country trying to find a later model car I know HZWB in actual fact if you go back to about episode 13 or something the WB Statesman it actually had them when we we're working on the front end you can see them under there and all they are is a round bar two eyelets at each end and bolted to the to the frame so Rather than chasing all over the countryside, trying to part a car out or something like that, we're just going to make some. I just got some 25mm round bar. It's got about a 2.5mm wall on it, thereabouts, I don't know. And we're just going to make some of our own. So, let's get into it. So, like I said, I've just got some tube. And I'm just going to use the press just to flatten out the end. I want about 8mm hanging out the back, so we'll call that good. I'm just going to flatten him out. And that just gives you your, your little pad, and then I'll squash the two ears. So I just squash down the corner so he's fairly flat across there. And just to flatten that angle out, I'm going to push on there and just squash him in a little. Now one of these ends I'm going to want more angled than the other. Because one surface is almost flat and one's not. Cross members actually got a fair bit of curve to it. But we'll see how that's looking for shape. Now, oh, that's not too bad. Now, that might not be the exact factory position 
in actual fact I think they were referred over here but with the control arms out I'm just making sure as long as you're going from the base of the cross member to this control arm without interfering on anything that'll do me I'll start drilling some holes and it's right about now I wish I had a drill press but I don't now as I said I'm not worried about factory spec factory position it went from here to there that's fine but do make them symmetrical make sure they're at least in the same spot left to right you know so I can sleep at night the old drill work for it. Anyway, it's done. So I've just checked my holes that line up. Well, I'd like to think they line up. I just drilled them. Mm. Pretty close. And so we'll pretty up these ends, make them look factory. Kind of. That's my two bars, and those are, as I said, flattened out, hole drilled in the top, round off the corners. I put a bit of edge primer on them. Anyway, I'll get them painted, and while they're drying, we'll get into something else. Oh, actually, I'll show you how we're going to do the bolts. Is I going to put a bolt inside that cross member coming out there? And that's easy enough getting it in when there's no control arm. But how do you get a spanner in there? Well, we're not going to. And the same here. This one's a little easier in that you can get a spanner in there. But I don't want to. So what I'm going to do is get a piece of bar. I'm going to weld 15 mils of bar to the top of that bolt. So basically, when you go to turn the bolt and wants to turn, it's got a little tail on it. Once you've got that bolt in there, inside the cross member with a tail on it, as you're trying to tighten it up, the tail is going to hit on the inside of that cross member and lock up. So you'll be able to tighten it without anything on the inside. And when you back it off, the tail's going to swing right around and lock up on this edge. And see, that bolt's just going to hang out like that. And that's the wing. So as you twist it, it hits on that side of the frame. Or undo it, it swings around, hits on that side of the frame. Like this. Locks up to there. If you go to undo it, hits on that side of the frame. So now you can... Do it up without having to try and get a spanner in there. That one, not that hard. This one, very difficult. And I might even, I might even run a vacuum in there because that's, that's full of dirt and grass seeds and whatnot. So I'll run the vacuum in there and vacuum that out. So getting the ball joints out of these control arms, it's not hard. You just heat, it. and I do mean heat it. Sit the control arm over, maybe the top of your vice or something and then just hit down on the ball joint. I should pop out. These guys are not so easy. They press in from the outside. Getting them out, not so, because they've got to come this way. It's not as easy. You can't set your press up from here and push them out. I find the easiest way, the simplest way, is to burn them out, literally. Literally just set them on fire. As the rubber burns away, it allows the centre pin there to be able to be pushed out, then the rubber comes away, and then the outer case. And I've heard over the years people say, oh, you shouldn't do that, it weakens them and all that. It really doesn't, because they don't, it's, it doesn't transfer that much heat. I can still touch that control arm right up to there. It's, to give you an idea what I'm talking about or that I'm not bullshitting but the top of the metal there 57 degrees so too hot to touch but not hot enough to, to worry the steel check out that one, the pin's pushing itself out oh that, that one too
Then give them a little tap. Just give them a tap. Maybe a bit of WD. Grab the old trusty air chisel. Yeah, I know, there's probably prettier ways to do that, but that's the fastest way I know. The longest part of that job is waiting for the rubber to burn. And I say about transferring heat, there's the inner case of the rubber. It hasn't even melted, so it's really not transferring heat into the control arm. Well, not much anyway. And I like the air chisel. Just go around the edge and work it out. And as I say, there's probably prettier ways, but after that centre burnout, to get the cases out, Literally took seven minutes, so that's definitely the fastest way I know. Not the cleanest way, but the fastest way. So anyway, I'll stop talking. We'll get the control arms wire wheeled and start putting the new ones back in. Now, same as always, if you've seen me do bushes like this, it's heat, heat your control arm, and that guy's just come out of the freezer He's fairly cold, but these actually go in pretty easy because they're not press fitted at the start. You just got to make sure they're sitting correctly in there and don't touch that because it's hot, Michael. And just support the back of it with, it's just an old piece of exhaust tube that I've welded a plate on, just like that. I mean, before it gets, um, before it cools down is what I'm trying to say. So I just line my exhaust tube up on the back there like that. Make sure my bush is sitting ready to go. And then just wind him in. And it won't actually take a lot of effort to push it. If you're really pedantic about it, you could put a piece of timber there, but honestly, these don't take a lot of pressure and they just slide in. Drop my ball joint in. Do refrain from hitting them too. If, if you've got no other choice, there's no other way to get it in, do something like that that fits right around the edge so you're not damaging the end of the ball joint because it crushes down on the actual joint. Actually, I don't know if my vice will open far enough. No, it's not gonna. So I've got two choices. Cut that down or try the press? Let's go to the press. So all we're doing is putting the exhaust tube with the plate flat on the base because these have got a lot of shape in them. They rock around, so I prefer to do it that way. So your ball joint, start him off just sitting there. I might have heated that one a bit much, he's sizzling. Make sure that's in there. A big socket. If you see just there, in he goes. That's our ball jump. Now I'm not painting with anything elaborate. Just a zinc etch primer and rattle can black. The old driveway's copping a clog in this morning. But that's what I like about the rocks. Give it a rake and all the evil goes away. So we'll start on the steering side of things. I don't need any of this. I just need that nut, that nut, and that rod from both sides. 
So we'll chuck this in the vise, start cracking. All I'm going to do is grab that bar with the vise, heat here, back that, that nut off and remove the tie rod. Again, back that nut off, remove the tie rod and take that section just from both sides. But before I start removing anything, I'm going to take a couple of measurements to the best that I can because they actually move. I'm going to try and center those tie rods and measure from the center of the tie rod to the center of that tie rod. And that way I can try and put this bar into the new tie rods and have it as close to that measurement as I can. Don't get me wrong, it's still got to be wheel aligned, but if I can set that up roughly how it came out, I have a better chance of getting it to the point where we do less work at the other end when we're wheel lining it by getting this as close to how it came apart as we can. better clarify a little something here because I'm talking to myself and going yeah maybe they didn't get that I was saying about left hand part numbers and right hand part numbers of these tie rod ends but it's not left hand part number or left part number is for the left side of the car right it's not like a right part number and a right part number it's actually right hand thread this is, see I've marked this with an L, that's the left side. I made sure that I've, that's the left side of the car, but that's an R, because that's a right hand thread. And that's an L, that's a left hand thread. Because that's, that's how this rod is, it's right hand thread on one end, left hand thread on, on the other end. So you're turning it righty tighty on this side, lefty tighty on this side. Why is that? Well, when you go to get a wheel alignment, to change the length of this distance, you're winding, you back these nuts off and you're winding this rod. <clears throat> if it was right thread, right thread, all it would do is shift. It wouldn't push both out, that one to go out, this one to come in. So being left thread on one side, right thread on that side, on the other side, when you undo or twist that, it pushes them both apart or both together, which that's connected to your steering arm. So it's gonna bring your steering arm in or out. So the part numbers are two left hand, which will be what I'm finding is it's the inner and the outer is the right thread. So I've got right hand thread outer on the left rod, left hand thread on the inner. Stop talking, just get it done. So that's him all back together. And like I said, the only bit I've used out of the, the old section is the rods and those locking nuts. And out of absolute curiosity, if you do have one of these all pulled apart and you want to chuck it back together, they were 364 mil from the center of the tie rod to the center of that tie rod. So I just want to knock the calipers off now. Um, one, to have a look at the condition and two, just to get the right rebuild kit and make it a bit lighter so i can get it up in the vice knock that top ball joint off and clean up all this crap clean up the stub we've got new bearings and the new discs to go on so we'll knock these bolts out it, the caliper is just two bolts one there and one there should just lift off So the disc is a little bit rusty. I'll just get a pry bar. <clears throat> Couple of different calipers in these. That's a cast iron PBR. I think there's an alloy, alloy PBR as well. And then there's Gerlock as well. I think they're aluminium as well. So we'll get a cast 
iron PBR caliper kit ordered and some new hoses too I guess I'll chuck that in the vise and get that ball joint cracked so we can clean up that stub axle then we'll put the disc off check the bearings now we'll just put new bearings in it I'll come this far get the new disc on and then the stubs ready to go back on I right, I'll knock that one off so to get the discs and that cup off get yourself a dead blower a rubber hammer and just try and hit that angle on your bearing cup I say rubber because if you happen to miss and hit there with a steel hammer you'll flatten that you'll hate yourself so oh that was I got it first go I'm lucky I did get it first go because second go was an air swing now split pin nut off bearing out disc off Got a lot done though. Anyway, that's all I got to say. See you in the morning. So first thing this morning, I've got to get these stub axles separated. We've already got the control arms done. We had a spare set of them. But I'll get these off, get them cleaned up. So I'm starting to sound like it's this episode's let's learn how to heat everything. But heat them up. This episode, how to fix shit with fire. Cracking. And I've just got the vice holding the stub and not the ball joint, not the control arm. Crack him. Put the top of the... Now, we're not reusing this ball joint, so it doesn't matter if you destroy it. That's the wrong hammer. That'll do. Whatever. Um, have your nut same height as the ball joint, the top of the ball joint, and just hit him. That's it. I'll knock that guy out, control arm go on the back of the shed for next HQ we get, if we get one. Because they all seem to flog those bushes out, those top control arm bushes. Remember back in the wagon episode, it was the only part we replaced. And this wasn't that bad either. If I'd found this with a motor and transmission in it, I probably wouldn't be doing this. It's only that we've put the big block in it, we're going to try and do some sort of speed. But I don't really want to chance shitty old parts. I don't Let's get that out, get these cleaned up. And just to knock that bearing off, just heat the edge of him. Just put your screwdriver just under the bottom race. On a bit of an angle. Don't hit it hard. I say don't hit it hard in case you're going to reuse it, but there's nothing wrong with that bearing, I might add. Even the grease isn't discoloured. Oh well, let's get new ones. And with the seal, it'll just come off. Just like that. All right, we'll get them cleaned up. So, stab axles are cleaned up, painted, they're just drying. So, it's so time to get all that back in there. You saw it all come apart, let's rip in it, put it all back together. Having to get a little bit creative uh, with the springs. Spring compressors are not my favourite tool, not anyone's favourite tool really, but the problem with the spring compressors on the HQ is you can compress them but you can't get them in there because the compressor's in the way. So I've got a bit creative and I've put two rows of fencing wire and yeah it looks agricultural but it gets it done. So there's a row there, a row there and if we flip him over there's two rows there as well. And then you just back off the compressor gently and that'll hold it just compressed enough because I only need about another 10 mil and I can get it past the shock mounts. So I'll back these guys off slowly and just keep an eye on them, make sure they're not unwinding. If you're going to do that, don't put it around the hole, top to bottom of the spring because when it's sitting on the pad, 
it's going to jam your wire. Put them a couple of coils back. So that when the coil's in, you just nip that, pull the wire out, nip that, and the other two as well. Right up, we'll get him in. Agricultural, but it works. So once you got your spring in and your stub done up top and bottom, you just nip your wire like that. And that, because now the weight's on the spring, obviously. And if I can grab that wire and then just pull him out. There you are, spring. So here's where we're up to. Upper and lower control arms in, the stubs are back in, the steering's back in, brand new springs, and I've chucked the discs, and if you remember, the only reason I'm putting new discs on is I've gone larger with a stud, that's a half inch Ford style stud, and whacked some new wheel bearings in it, it's all done up. I'm just waiting for sway bar bushes, and then the front end's pretty much buttoned up. My bars are in, my little strengthening bars are in. They come up good. So you look at under here now and you think, that is mint. And then you bring it down off the hoist and go, no, it's not. So the next thing we're going to do is get some brakes back. So I'm going to rip them apart and just find out what I actually need, whether I need a piston or just a seal kit or a complete rebuild kit. So. We'll get pads either way, but you don't always need to order a piston. I'll see what condition that's in. Anyway, I'll stop talking. I'll get into them. So, generally all I do with a caliper, if you want to remove the piston, is just heat the caliper, bust the seal, WD in around the seal, and then just try and crack it with your, with your multi-grips. Just... So it's sort of free, so you can spin it. And the other one took actually took some shifting. Oh, and this one's going there too, so I have to work on that. But what what you generally do is add it, your pad back in, and then just add a little bit of compressed air, and, and I mean little, like start off very low in pressure, and it should just work its way out once you've freed it up. But that one wasn't coming out. And so I added a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more. And then decided, well, maybe I'll take the hose off. Took the hose off, straight into the caliper, didn't turn my compressor down, and it popped out. So it turns out that hose was the only reason it wasn't coming out, was maybe that hose, or that hose. So I'm gonna take the hose off this time, fill the, piston area with WD and then like I said just rock that piston see if I can get it to move caliper back in turn my compressor down and then just blow that guy out again nice and gentle the the reason you put your your brake pad back in is so that it catches on here and doesn't go rocketing over there which that last one I was getting frustrated up the ante whacked it in there and it popped out. I didn't have the pad in. Luckily it hit on there and stopped. But that could have became a, a bit of an exciting time, let us say. Anyway, it's out. Well, I'll work on this one. I'll rock him back and forth and see if I can free him up. This one's worse than the other one. Just trying to essentially melt that O-ring seal. Oh my god! Little bit. It's moving. 
I'm nervous. If you just watch, just get off. If you just watch that piston there. But I'm very nervous. You can just see it moving. I'm not going to add too much air to that. So I'll just keep trying to work it first. If, if I can break it free, it'll it'll come out, but oh that's starting to move now. Oh here we go. Maybe that's all she took. Oh here we go. So I filled that back reservoir with WD. So that bit of air maybe forced it up around the seal. Maybe the fire burnt the seal. I don't know. Try not to destroy the edge of the piston, although you can get kits complete with piston. Don't think looking at that one probably won't need one though. We'll have a go now. I might actually put a couple of them in there. I'm nervous. Might put one upside down. And like I said, that's only to catch the piston if it starts coming because you don't want it turning into some weird missile. Oh, I sounded very excited then, didn't I? Oh, I'm actually pretty excited because that was painful. There you go. And again, that's that's not that bad. I'll probably clean that up with a bit of Scotch Brite and just see see if I can salvage those pistons. And in here, I'll show you in here. And if you look in here, that's actually the piston seal there. But all the bore behind that is actually quite good. So I'm going to get a razor blade, run around and dig that old rubber seal out. And maybe, maybe just run a scotch bright down there and a scotch bright down that piston. And see if this just needs a new seal and dust cover kit. And if that's the case, I'll clean up these slides and we'll just about have rebuilt calipers. One thing that I guess take away from this is don't assume because they look terrible on the outside and like that on the inside, that they're necessarily going to be rusted out and need a complete new caliper that guy had a bit of crap come out of it, it was pretty dirty but that bore is okay that's clearly had fluid in it the whole time it's been parked so we'll clean them up and see if we can get some breaks happening so i know pulling calipers apart might seem a bit daunting but they're actually pretty straightforward and if you take a look inside of these guys there's really only that's where your piston fits into and that groove there is where the is where that piston seal sits in and the one on the outside there that's your dust seal so in here isn't as important as it is on the piston surface so if that little groove there where your piston seal lives is okay they're pretty much right to reuse this next one is only a dust seal. You can get away if they're a bit surface rusty and shitty. So fluid's obviously coming in here. And that's that hole there. So the fluid comes into this compartment here. That seal stops it getting out. And if you see that little hole over there, that is, that's your bleed nipple. So pretty much on a caliper, as long as that channel there is in reasonable condition, you can get away with the caliper and reuse them. The piston on the other hand is not the case. So like I say, the piston's a little bit different story. And I know calipers pulling them apart, they seem a bit daunting. I know the first time I went to pull one apart, I thought they were full of witchcraft and, and wizardry, but they're actually really, really simple. That's obviously the piston that fits into the caliper and the fluids on this side of it coming in through the, the line hole that I 
I showed you. And this seal goes in that groove in that caliper. So as the piston's sliding up and down in, inside that caliper, that seal seals the fluid on this side. When I first pulled these out, I thought they're pretty good. They look good till you get to there. That's pitting. That's rust pitting. It's really minor, but over time it's going to leak. If your seal is running in that area there, the seal's not going to be able to get into the pitting and you're going to get small amounts of fluid over time bleed past it. So you can get away with calipers that are a bit surface rusty and a bit shitty, but they're not expensive. Just get yourself some new pistons and seal kit. So I'll ring up and order one of them now, but there's stacks I can go on with this. So I'll get on the phone, get a piston and seal kit ordered and we'll get into some other stuff. I have welded up that diff. I did that last night. So we can refill that and the drive shafts here. I forgot to tell you, the drive shaft turned up yesterday afternoon, which I did think that was going to be one. I'd be at the end of the video going, oh, I hope that turns up. No, nah, four day turnaround from the minute I said, yep, go ahead with it. To they rang me and said, it's ready. I didn't tell them it was through a video. It's just a company that just did their job. Stickers on the shaft, you'll see who it was like. So hopefully this time, we will keep all the oily goodness on the inside of the diff not running at the bottom. Actually, that's a good point. I have zero confidence, so I'm not going to fill that. I'm just going to, that's about three quarters of a litre. I'll just wait for a bit. We'll get the drive shaft in. I don't know. And I got that drive shaft, and like I said, I was excited. It only took a few days. That's them right there. Didn't tell them anything about a video. They just did the job they were asked to do in a good amount of time. Oh, it's in gear, damn it. Neutral. And just fits. And it's a local guy. Well, you know couple of hours down the road local to me in Newcastle local enough that's not the first one they've done either they did the big block EH I uh, did that one a lot of years ago oh and an FB rat rod FB Holden about a 60 ish Holden Ute rat rod we've got coming up did that one too and I know that looks on a steep angle, but it's because the suspension's drooped. So I think that's it for today. I think that's beer time. My weld on my diff did hold. It didn't leak again, so I've topped that up. Brake kit is ordered. So we're getting somewhere. Drive shaft's in. We're getting ready to actually make this thing move. I keep looking at this thing underneath and going, it's mint. And then looking at the top and going, no, it's not. Nope. Anyway. That's probably another job we've got tomorrow, is start cutting a hole in that bonnet. Till then, it's beer time. See you in the morning. So he's down off the hoist, and this morning I intended on whacking the wheels on and getting stuck into the bonnet. But it's actually three days later, because I had to go back to work for a little while. But it actually worked okay, because all our brake gear and our sway bar bushes are here. So I can now get the calipers finished off, the sway bar on, and then that's underneath completely finished. And then we can get outside and sort out that bonnet. Just so that carby will actually fit underneath there. And we can get an air cleaner out the top. So that's the old seal. And the kit comes with a couple of different seals. There's your dust seal. That goes on last. And then there's two different widths in the new seal. So it's, it's that guy there. There's your new piston. And then in he goes. There he goes. Once your, your piston's right in, Get your finger and push down hard on that seal 
and then just go around and that'll just try and get that lip of that seal to get under the edge of the ridge of that caliper I've shown you before. You'd probably go, well duh, but when you get that seal in, depress that piston right in, put your pads in so you get the correct gap there, so you can actually slide him over. So caliper is on, new brake lines on, sway bar bushes and sway bars back on. That's pretty much the front end tied up. So we'll get the wheels on, drop him down. So that was all I got done that day. I rebuilt the calipers, I was halfway through bleeding the brakes and the phone rings. A couple of cars I've been talking to a guy about, rings me, we work out a deal, so I spent the next two days on the road. And there's something completely different that we've done before. One is actually a four wheel drive. But anyway, we'll get to that in a future episode. Let's get back to the HQ. So I've been waiting for today for quite some time. Today is the day we cut the bonnet, put an air cleaner and scoop on the bonnet so we can actually shut it. And I used to like the reverse cowls on the 70s GM cars. And so that's what I've chose. But over here, all I could get was a fiberglass remake, but it was pretty long. And I wanted to just make it a bit more tactful. So I just ran a strip of tape across the front and just kept trimming off on the front and then slid it right back to the back of the bonnet and trimmed off at the back just to make it a bit smaller and a bit more tactful because let's face it mucus is all about tact so at the back there now it's about three inches high being fiberglass i have to give that a little sand and a prime just to prep it and then then i'm just going to pull the bonnet down onto the top of the carburetor mark where the vent tube touches the bonnet, measure back, drill a hole, and we'll just start from there. I'm not gonna cut a perfect round hole for an air cleaner. I'm actually gonna take a fair bit out in a big rectangle, just to let some of the bad air out, or the good air in, or whichever. And then we'll get him stuck to the top here and screwed down. And then do something with these stripes that make me tick. Anyway, we'll stop talking. Let's get into this. So I'll just run through really quickly what we've done because I'm starting to run out of time on this one but I just drilled four holes one in each corner and then just taped across straight lines and then just die grinded these rounded in sections I've taped where the scoops going to go and now I'm going to strip the paint on the inside of that tape line for the adhesive and I've got two little screws one there and one there that's how it always goes back in the same spot so once I strip the paint I can plonk him down, put those screws in, you know it's straight, and the adhesive would do its job. And under here, I just followed the edge of that inner skin around to round off the tops, and then straight across the back there, just to let some air out. And there's the two panels. That guy, I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to fix the rust in his guards with it. I'm going to repair mucus with mucus steel. So I've got a coat of primer over him and I've just sat him back in the correct spot. As I said, I've got two little holes there so it always goes back in the right spot. And then I've run a pencil mark around the outside. So when I lift the scoop off, so I can still see my pencil line. And I'll get in out of the wind and tell you what this crap is. And this is what I'm sticking it on with. A high strength structural adhesive. Run a little bead just inside that pencil line stick him down, screw him in, and then we'll let him dry.
So that's him just glued on. But the wind's starting to pick up out here. We're about to get our July and August winds. So I'm going to back him back in, but I'm going to give that the absolute minimum time to dry because I'm in a hurry. And that guy's still still drying, so I'm just going to go around and tidy up some loose ends. Uh, the transmission dipstick, a little bit of wiring there I'll tidy up and just get him ready to fire back up because if you remember, this isn't just an engine swap. This thing hasn't driven under its own power in over 20 years, so I just want to go through again, check some wiring, make sure it's not going to burst into flames just while that urethane there is drying and then we'll come back and we'll blend in this patina I think see what we can do with that there's a little job back here and that is I want to get rid of a few of these holes because when I tidy up those stripes on the front I'm also going to come over the boot with them and I want to get rid of these guys it's clearly had a wing across the back of it at some stage and there's little holes drilled everywhere so I'm just going to zap them up and then the black stripes will come over the boot and over those welds. Spots welded at the back, sort of top off the transmission. He had a, an old factory dipstick tube, but the bracket was gone. So I replaced it with a new braided one. They look great, but, and they probably read fantastic to get a nice little, little dipstick. And, but the hole down the middle of the tube is so small that it's taking me forever to put some transmission fluid in this thing. I've literally put two of these in. This is the third in a solid half an hour. But at least it gives time for the bonnet to dry. Anyway, stop whinging. Keep pumping. What are they, a litre? Would that be a litre? I think they're a litre. If I pump too fast, it spews out the top. So you just gotta go nice and slow spewing out again all right this is this is getting ridiculous um, not only is it going in slow but I think now the pan is actually full and so now it's trying to breathe I guess out the breather and out the dipstick tube so now the only way I'm gonna make it better is actually to start it and get the transmission to pump fluid into the cooler and into the converter which empties the pan so I can refill the pan. So uh, I think it's time to start it, which shouldn't be an issue because last episode we started up, broke in the cam and lifters. Well, the lifters, the cam wasn't brand new. So I guess I'll just add some spark and see if we can start it. See if I can get some more fluid in that thing. So that should have been enough just to empty that pan. That still sounds good. Actually, if you haven't seen the first episode on mucus, I'll tell you a little bit about the motor. It's a 396. Why? Because I had it. But she's not stock, um, as you probably heard then. It's two bolt block, but it has a main cap girdle for strength. Um, factory steel crank, H-beam rods, and some big dome top pistons. Like I'm talking, if this thing was decked to zero when it was built with those pistons, it's 13 to 1. It's 
ridiculous. If it wasn't decked, it's about 12.4, which is still ridiculous, but it's better than 13 to 1 trying to run it on the street. But it's what I had. I didn't build it that way. I actually bought it from a guy that had it built for a nostalgia dragster or a nostalgia altered. It's an 830 annual discharge double pumper up the top. And just a cheap single plane manifold. I actually wish that was a dual plane, but anyway, we won't go into that. HEI distributor, nothing elaborate. We're getting close. I did pull that into reverse um, just as it was idling there, just to see if it moved and also to try and fill the valve body. It didn't move, though. So you don't run it too long in case you flog out the converter or damage anything. If I can get enough fluid in it, well, of course I can, it'll just take me a while. But when I get enough fluid in it, I might actually be able to drive it out. I never showed too much excitement, but I can tell you right now, I am fizzing on the inside like a little kid. Yeah, I'm going to have to do it again. It's now pumping it back out. It's It obviously needs to be cycled through. I might check the breather's not blocked too. Maybe it's not breathing out the top of the box. pumps are working. I just blipped the throttle a couple of times, it did absolutely nothing. I'll get to that. Let's get some more fluid in it. That seemed to fill up really quick that time. I might just see if it'll get a gear now, because that, that seemed to fill that pan really quick. She's out, but she's not supremely happy. So it kept wanting to die on me as I was coming out, and so I kept flicking the fuel pump off and it had improved. So I think the accelerator pumps are working. I've checked them, but I'm gonna check float levels. I reckon either these are high. Yep. How it should be is you take that guy out, no fuel should come out, and then you just bump the car with your hip so it should be the level would be right at the base of that but that just poured out so either that float is stuck or it's too high they're both too high or both stuck so i don't know if i recommend doing this but i'm going to do it so the float is is just inside that bowl there it's quite big so i'm i'm just going to push into the side of it with this piece of wire sit it on the side of the float and lift the float up and drop it down. Just like that. Okay, so they're not stuck. So clearly the needle and seat, uh, clearly the float level needs to be dropped down so the needle shuts off earlier. I probably didn't notice that when we were running it in because I had it at the throttle the whole time so I was probably using enough fuel. So to take the float down, we're just gonna crack this nut. half a turn down
was one big backfire, one big cough. <laughs> so I put these float level screws, whatever, I put them back in, get my extreme fire hazards out. I'll just fire him with the pump on and see what the level does. I actually went three quarters of a turn, so we'll see. pretty angry at idle. Okay, so nothing come out the hole. So hit it with a hit. Oh, I gave it a big hit, but the fuel poured out, so I don't think that's too bad. I'm gonna leave it at that. It's already happier, it already wants to idle, so at least now I'd be able to idle it, check the timing. I might come up a quarter turn, actually. I've really got to give that one a hit. And here he sounds, that idle sounds very chattery. This has got any pump up lifters in it, um, which is a bit of a high performance thing. It does sound like it's got a solid mechanical cam in it, but it's a hydraulic, just with any pump up. up to me a bit on that one but that transmission did take a hundred times longer than it should have and it wasn't really a problem it was just the aftermarket tube that's the factory tube there and it's probably a 13 or 14 mil hole but it doesn't have a mounting bracket on it and I couldn't find one so I just bought an aftermarket one thinking that'd be the easy thing to do there's nothing wrong with it looks great bolts on nice fits good but it's just got about an eight millimeter hole at the base where it goes into the transmission and in hindsight i should have drilled it out but i didn't have hindsight so anyway it's done and it's running it drove not well and i think i might have to pull the bowls off the carburetor that has been sitting for a while and modern fuel evaporates quickly and leaves behind a residue and that's not idling great one minute idles next minute it doesn't so I might just clean out the idle circuit on it. But all in all, bonnet's cut, uh, urethane the scoop on, um, gave it as long as I could to dry, and then just sand around the edge of it. Sorry there was a lot of time lapse in that one, but I'm running out of time. Um, felt like a bit of a 
fish out of water with the body fill around the edge. Feel a bit amateur, I haven't done that in a while, but I'll give them a practice on that. We've got a full rust repairs, body work, paint job coming up, basically a full restoration in the not so distant future. So I'll brush up on that soon enough. But anyway, he did drive, not great. I'm going to say it moved under its own power, I won't say it drove. But tomorrow, I'll get the bonnet sorted out. And if you haven't guessed by now, yep, I'm going to paint Monaro stripes onto it. Just because I don't want to paint it yet. I don't want to lose the patina on this thing yet. It's shitty and I just want to keep it that way at least until I can get it back on the road. And here's some irony for you. Take a wild guess at the name of this colour. Can't make this shit up. It's called patina gold. It sounds way better in person than it does on camera. It sounds awesome. Anyway, still got a fair bit done. That might do us. I'll see you in the morning. So last night, I did pull the front and the rear bowls off this carburetor. And I'm just going to blow out the idle ports. Just to try and clean out that body. Because in the bowls, what I found, that's the rear bowl. And if you can just see, it's not perfectly clean. And the front one, I found little black specks. If you see in that corner there, and also there, little black gritty specks. And what I think that is, is when I've cut all these new fuel lines, obviously we blew them out with compressed air, but I'd say there's little black specks that are traveling into the carburetor. And that's enough to block your idle circuits and hence give me a bit of, a bit of grief. So I will get them cleaned out, but I haven't put it back together because I'm waiting on an email back to tell me the factory jet sizes for this carburetor because I want to go back to standard and start with just a baseline of where that carburetor should be. So in the meantime, I'll cover this up, we'll drag him out and we'll get into this paintwork. The only way I was going to sleep at night was get rid of those black stripes and the only way I can think of getting rid of them is masking better Monaro stripes into it. So for anyone that's actually interested, the measurements that I could find was 50mm up from the nose cone, a 12mm stripe, a 6mm stripe. So 50mm up here, that's 12mm which I've just doubled up 6mm tape and then masked the 6mm line in. So, And I've done the same down the middle. And as far as trying to patina it back in to look the same, I don't think I'm going to have to. I think it'll do itself because when I pull this tape, it's pulling paint off. Anyway, I'll get some black on this before this wind picks up any harder. Prettied up the stripes, carby's back together and cleaned, jets are right. The last thing I wanted to do was just put a universal filter, kind of like that, you know, just a generic filter. But they've only got tiny little inlets and outlets, so I wanted to find one I could use with 3 8 in, 3 8 out. And I would have looked like a dick doing it, but I stood in the shop and opened every filter I could find till I found. 3 8 in, 3 8 out, universal filter. That's a part number there, Z153K. I'll bang that in. I think I've done enough. Let's just drive it. I've done enough.
start in the rain. Lucky I'm working in the shed today. I think the wagon's windows are down there. Cool. Oh, fucking difficult. Hopefully I can bash my head on something. Start again, that sounds shit. Pretty good at that, Michael. Where's the... Where's the thing? There. There it is. Snap it off with you. In angry video. I so much want to just touch that and undo it with my fingers. But I know it's hot. So I'll probably do it anyway. Trip, trip over some shit. Seriously, how long are they? Upper. Oh, up there. That's lower, dickhead. That's upper. Don't recommend this at all. What's up, Dad? Oh, what's better? Mental note. Go clockwise as you go down and it drops in. Thanks for hanging in there on that one. I know it was a long one. And do hit the buttons and stick around. We've got two Aussie classic revivals coming up next. And don't forget, visit backshed.net.au because it does go a long way helping us get some of this crap back on the road. But that's it for another one. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.